Welcome to New Life Assembly of God's Media Ministry. We are glad that you are here. We believe the Word of God is relevant and life-changing, and hope that we will be blessed by this message. Amen. If you'll take your scriptures in hand and turn with me to Song of Solomon, chapter 1. Song of Solomon, chapter 1. Anybody ever heard a series of sermons on Song of Solomon? Yeah, maybe two of you, all right. <laughs> but uh, we are going to be looking at the book of the Song of Solomon in a series titled Love, Marriage, and Sex. And today's message is a true love story, a true love story. You know, a few years ago, there was a movie titled True Love. And the description for the movie reads, True love plunges into the middle of the preparations for a marriage and shows us a man and woman being swept towards matrimony by a tide of relatives, friends, traditions, and plans. While the couple has a strong physical attraction, they're all wrong for each other and probably too young to be getting married, and everybody knows it. Everybody knows it, but they're continuing to push them to marriage. Michael, the groom, is an immature alcoholic who would rather spend time with his friends than helping his bride, Donna, with planning the wedding. Donna continues with her wedding preparations, hoping that Michael will realize that his days of partying with the boys are numbered. As the wedding day grows closer, both are getting cold feet. Even as the bride is on her way to the church for the wedding, her father is assuring her it's not too late to back out. But heck with your life. How can you disappoint your friends and family? He's trying to dissuade her from going through. He's saying, don't just go through with it because you don't want to disappoint your friends and family. The climax comes at the wedding reception when Donna flees to the restroom after Michael informs her that he is going out drinking for one last time with the guys. This is on his wedding day at the wedding reception. And he doesn't even realize how ludicrous it is that he would rather spend his wedding night with his buddies than with his bride. And the movie ends with a clear sense of foreboding that this marriage is doomed. This marriage is doomed. You know, Donna experienced what so many others have, a love story that turned out to be a heartbreak. For many, the subject of love and intimacy seems like a well-kept secret that they have been excluded from. But it doesn't have to be a mystery. The Bible has a lot of practical and explicit teaching about the subject of love and sex. Even an do you know God devoted an entire book in the Bible to the subject of love, sex, and marriage? That's, that's what the Song of Solomon is all about. You know why? Because God is the expert, the expert on love, sex, and marriage. Not Dr. Short Little Ruth that likes to spout out all of the uh, sex information. No, she's not the expert. Amen? She has a secular perspective on everything. God is the expert on love, sex, and marriage. God invented sex. God invented marriage. And God is the source of all true love. So he is the expert. And he has given us an instruction manual so that we can experience the joy, the passion, and the fulfillment that he created us to experience within the lifelong covenant of marriage between one man and one woman. Now, the message of the Song of Solomon is so very relevant for us today because we live in a culture that is um, uh, um, uh, uh, just filled with sexual chaos and confusion. Everywhere you look, there's, there's so much confusion regarding sex and sexuality. And that's why the Song of Solomon is so very important for this generation. It speaks to the deep desire of the human heart to love someone passionately and to be equally loved in return in a relationship that will last for a lifetime. The encouraging news of the Song of Solomon is that God desires for you to experience that kind of lifelong, passionate, and joyful love in the context of the lifetime commitment of marriage between one man and one woman. What we need to understand is that God is vitally interested in your love life. 
and God is very interested in your choice of a marriage partner if you're not yet married, because next to your relationship with him, there is nothing that will affect your life more than who you marry. And that's why the message of the Song of Solomon is so very important. It tells us the love story of a couple, Solomon and a poor Shulamite woman. Solomon, a rich man, a king, and a poor Shulamite woman depicted as the lover and the beloved. And they had a very strong attraction for each other. I mean, right from the get-go, when you begin reading the Song of Solomon, in chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Kiss me and kiss me again, for your love is sweeter than wine. So you can see they have this strong physical attraction to each other. And God created us with the capacity to be attracted to the opposite sex. I remember several years ago, I was a young adults pastor, and there was a young man in our young adults group that he had just gotten saved in our group and was trying to serve the Lord. But he had come from, you know, a sexually moral lifestyle. And so he came to speak to me one day about how he was struggling with sexual purity. And he said to me, Pastor, just pray for me that God would take all sexual desire from me. I, I said, brother, I said, I can't pray that for you. I said, because God created us with that so that one day, you know, we could get married and, and, and have children and what have you. But I'll pray that God will give you the strength to be able to learn how to control those desires. You see, God created us with the capacity to be attracted to the opposite sex. And there is nothing wrong with that. If we never felt attraction or desire for the opposite sex, no one would ever get married. No one would ever have kids. And the human race would cease to exist. Attraction, however, is usually the first stage in any relationship, and there are two components to attraction. There is first and foremost the physical or outward attraction that has to do with things like the way a person looks, their voice, I mean, because just let's face it, if you don't find, if you, if you think somebody is ugly, you are probably not going to be attracted to them and want to have a relationship with them, Amen. So it has to do with the way a person looks. It has to do with their voice. You know, if somebody has an irritating voice, you know, there's some people that have, oh, can we do that? You're going to be like, run the other direction, you know? <laughs> so it has to do with things like their looks, their voice, their laughter. You know, if they laugh like a pig, snort like a pig, amen. <laughs> their fragrance, if they don't smell good, Amen. Their touch, how they make us feel, how we feel with, when we're with them. All of those things play into that physical or outward attraction. And if any of those things are a turnoff, we're not likely to seek to know that person any further. Right? Am I right? All right. A few of you are answering. The rest of you are like, where is she going? Okay. But what happens is that a lot of people experience what we call chemistry. That's that attraction. They experience that chemistry and they begin to pursue a relationship based only on outward attraction. And those are the relationships that will generally end in heartbreak. Why? Because physical attraction alone is not a solid foundation for any relationship. For one thing, that person may grow bald. They're going to get wrinkled. They're probably going to gain weight along the way. Amen. They may get sick. So physical attraction alone is not a solid foundation. But there's a lot of other reasons why it's not a solid foundation. See, there's a second type of attraction that is much more important than the physical or outward attraction that first draws us to a person. That, that outward attraction is important, but it cannot be the most important thing. You see, the second type of attraction is the inner qualities of a person. It has to do with their character, who they are as a person. It has to do with their spirituality, their relationship with God. Now, we don't have to give any thought to being outwardly attracted to a person, right? It just happens automatically. Am I right? You see somebody, there's a, a drawing, an attraction to them, maybe physically, to their personality, to their voice, to their look. Amen? So we don't have to give any, any thought, really, to that. It just happens. Because the outward qualities that draw us to a person, they're obvious. And we just naturally feel drawn to the things that we like about them. It, it, it's intuitive, it's natural, it's automatic. But inner attraction can be more difficult to recognize because it takes discernment 
It takes prayer and it takes observation. And usually it's best to observe them before you get connected to them. Because you're going to see a more honest image of who they are. Because let's face it, when people date, they're putting their best foot forward, right? So one, one expert said, whatever negative you see in a person when you're dating, magnify it by at least 10. And whatever positive you see, divide it by at least 10. You know why? Because they're, they're, they're showing you the side of themselves, the best side of themselves to win you, right? And there's a lot of stuff you ain't going to see till after you're married or until after they've got you. So it, it really requires some observation before you get connected in your heart to that person. Now, the Song of Solomon reveals three inner qualities that we want to look for, and of course, we want to develop in our own life, because to find the right person, you've got to be the right person. Let me just say that again. To find the right person, you've got to be the right person. You've got to be the qualities that you are looking for in another person, because if they have those qualities and you don't have those qualities, they're not going to be attracted to you. All right. So you've got to pray these qualities into yourself. And, and the same way each of us knows what attracts us outwardly, we need to know the inner qualities that we should be looking for in another person. And if you're already married, this message is for you as well. Why? Because these qualities that we're, we're going to um, be discussing, we need to pray that God will form them in us. Even if we're already married, we need to pray God will form them in us so that your marital relationship can be strengthened. Amen. So this message is for everybody, those who are already married, those who hope one day to be married, and even those who care about somebody who is married because it will equip you to give wise advice to them. So these inner qualities that we're going to talk about are what makes a solid foundation for a true love story that will result in a healthy, happy, and lasting marriage. So what attracted the man and woman to one another in Song of Solomon? We saw in verse 2 that there's already this strong physical attraction. Kiss me and kiss me again. Your kisses are like fine wine, you know. So there's this strong physical attraction. But what else attracted them to one another? Well, the Song of Solomon actually identifies three points of attraction that should be at the top of our list. The first point of attraction should be godly character. Look at uh, chapter 1, verse 3, and we're looking at the second part of verse 3. The Shunamite, Shunamite woman says, Your name is like the spreading fragrance of scented oils. No wonder all the young women love you. What is she talking about? Your name is like a spreading fragrance of scented oil. It's talking about reputation. A person's name represents their reputation. And he had a sweet or attractive reputation. So what is, it, what is this verse telling us? Pay attention to a person's reputation. A person's name is associated with their character. Let me illustrate that. If I mention the name Billy Graham, what comes to mind? What comes to my mind is a world-famous evangelist who through decades of ministry never had even one scandal associated with his name. He was a godly man. He was a man of integrity and a man of purity. His name carried a reputation. So when the Shulamite woman says, your name is like the spreading fragrance of scented oils, she's saying, the more I get to know about you, the more attractive your character is. You have a very godly character. Proverbs 12.4 says this in respect to a woman. It says, a wife of noble character is her husband's crown. But a disgraceful wife is like decay in his bones. Men, be careful. Don't just get attracted because of how she looks outside. Because you may end up with some decay in your bones. Amen. Something that's just rotting your life away. You don't want that. Amen. Godly character is so important. So don't be blinded by a person's good looks. Be more concerned if they are a person of godly character. Do they have integrity? Are they the same 
privately as they are publicly? Are they the same in church as they are outside of church? So that's all about integrity. All right. Do they have good morality? Do they have a, a biblical sense of right and wrong? And are they living by that? Are they honest? Are they truthful? Are they virtuous? All of these things are what you need to be looking for. And you also need to pay attention to a person's relationship with God. Some versions say your name is like purified oil. And this is a reference to the first pressing of olives that produced the best and purest oil. Today, we refer to it as the first cold-pressed extra virgin olive oil, right? Have you ever seen that? First cold-pressed. It's that first pressing without mechanical use. They just put a heavy weight on the, uh, on the olives, and it just naturally weights it down and produces the oil. And that's the best oil. That's the finest oil. So the first pressing of the olive oil in biblical days went for temple use only. It was to light the temple lampstand. It was to be dedicated to God for his worship only. So while all the women were attracted by Solomon's physical looks, the Shulamite woman was attracted by his relationship to God. He was like that first pressed oil. He was dedicated to God. So she was drawn by the fact that he was dedicated to and serving God. Sing, single people, here's a tip for you. No extra charge. Find somebody that will love you second in their life because they love God first. Because when a person loves God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, they'll know how to love you right. So find somebody that is in love with the Lord. And they'll know how to love you right. One pastor shared how he overheard his wife talking to his teenage girls as they were asking him how she met daddy and how she knew that he was the one. So he's eavesdropping outside the room. And his wife said, well, the most important thing that I can tell you girls is to look for a godly guy like your dad. He loves God and he has a godly character. And as she was saying all of these things about her husband, I mean, he was just feeling so good. You know, he was puffing his chest out. But then she said, it doesn't matter what he looks like. <sighs> that just deflated him. <laughs> she went on to say, I can promise you that if you marry someone who does not have a godly character, the odds are incredibly high that he or she will crush your heart. That's how important it is, folks. A godly character. That's the truth. The most important thing to look for is a person who loves God and has a vital growing relationship with the Lord. So if you're single, put that at the top of your list. If you're married, pray that that will be true of you. Pray that you will be someone who is devoted to God, who has a godly character, who loves God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and seeks God with everything that is within you. Because if you do that, it will make your marriage stronger. Amen. The second point of attraction should be trustworthiness. Trustworthiness. It's crucial to build a basis of trust. Look at Song of Solomon 1 verses 5 and 6. The Shulamite woman says, I'm dark but beautiful. O women of Jerusalem, dark as the tents of Kedar, dark as the curtains of Solomon's tents. Don't stare at me because I'm dark. The sun has darkened my skin. My brothers were angry with me and forced me to care for their vineyards, so I couldn't care for myself, my own vineyard. So the woman starts to open up and talk about her own insecurities. Her skin has been darkened. You know how after too much time in the sun, your skin gets really dark and leathery and wrinkly? She's insecure about this. Her sin has been, skin has been darkened by working long hours in the sun. And she hasn't had the time to care for herself the way that she would like to because she has been working very hard. She's been very busy. And she says, don't stare at me because I'm dark. What, what she's saying is I'm very self-conscious about this. I'm insecure about the way I look. And she can join the club because let me tell you something. Most women, no matter how beautiful they may be, battle with some form of insecurity regarding their looks. You know, my nose is too big, my ears are too big, my hips are too wide, my chest is too small. Most women 
battle, and, and, and you can say amen or oh me, but I know it's the truth. Mo most women battle with some form of insecurity regarding their looks. That's why, guys, if your wife ever puts on an outfit and comes to, me, comes to you and says, does this make me look fat? Never say yes. Say something like, you are always beautiful in my eyes. Amen? If you want to live. Amen. <laughs> But as you read through verses 8 and 10, that's exactly what this man does. He begins to tell her how beautiful he thinks she is. And he compliments the specific things that he finds so attractive about her. You know, your eyes are like a gazelle. Your neck is like a giraffe. Not exactly like that. But some, it's very poetic language. Men, you probably don't want to use that language nowadays. Because if you compare your wife to an animal, um, she may not like it too much. <laughs> But you can find out how to compliment your wife from the Song of Solomon. One pastor shared how he loved his wife through her insecurity over being rejected by a guy due to a previous relationship. And today, he said she has become a very strong and secure woman. But he, in turn, had his own securities. He, insecurities. He was scared of failure. And it kept him a lot of times from stepping out and doing new ventures and trying new things that he wasn't sure that he could master. And he thought if he failed, that people wouldn't accept him and that his wife would think less of him. But with time, he came to know that that she loved him, not because of what he could do or could not do, but because of who he was. And because her constant assurance of his love, no matter what, he became confident and he was able to, to overcome his insecurities. And folks, when you're married, that's what you've got to do for each other. You've got to be each other's greatest encourager. Amen. You've got to give one another those assurances that help uh, them to overcome those inse insecurities. And as you read through the Song of Solomon, you see how over time this couple loves each other through their insecurities. Secondly, trust is built by being trustworthy. Trust is being built by being trustworthy. I, tend, I attended a workshop several years ago about building trust. And as the speaker talked, he took out a centuries-old Bible that was a family heirloom. You know, the, the, the binding had worked itself loose, and many of the pages, you know, had separated. And so he took one of the loose pages, and he started to pass it through the class and ask them to handle it very carefully because it was fragile. And so as he passed it through the class, he told us not only how valuable this ancient Bible was because it had been passed down from generation to generation in his family, but as the page passed through the class, each person carefully and gently looked at it and then passed it on. And he said, this book is very important to me and it's very fragile. I shared one page with you and I'm watching how you handle it. If you don't treat it gently, I will not share the rest of this book with you because I know if I can't trust you with one page, I can't trust you with what is precious to me. He went on to talk about how in relationships, we share small parts of ourself and we watch to see how the other person treats it. Will they make fun? Will they mock? Will they talk about us to someone else? How will they treat those small pieces of ourself that we share with them? If we find that they can be trusted with those small pieces, guess what? We open ourselves up more and we share more of ourselves. To build trust in a relationship, we need to be found trustworthy. And trustworthiness needs to be on the top of our list of points of attraction as to what you're looking for in someone else. So you need to be trustworthy, but you need to watch to make sure that that other person is trustworthy as well. A third point of, of uh, attraction should be a God-honoring lifestyle. You need to find someone who is committed to live by God's standards. Most of us would agree that the majority of marriages that we see today are less than God's best. 
as a pastor for over 30 years, having counseled with many couples, what you see outwardly in church is not always what you see privately. Now, there are some wonderful marriages, and praise God for those. But a lot of marriages are not what God intends them to be. So if we want something different, then we have to live differently. Song of Solomon 1, verse 7, this woman sets the standard. She says, tell me, you whom I love, where you graze your flock and where you rest your sheep at midday. Why should I be like a veiled woman beside the flocks of your friends? You say, what on earth is she talking about? Well, veiled women back then referred to prostitutes. And they would hang around where the men worked during the day. Because that is where they got their business. And so she asked the question, why should I be like those other women who are following after your friends? Why should I be loose? Why should I be like everybody else? She's basically saying, other women may throw themselves at you and your friends, but I am not that, that way. I am not going to do that. I live by a different standard. And if you want me, you got to live by that standard as well. There's an old saying, you might have heard it before, why buy the cow if you can get the milk for free? Amen. You want somebody that's committed, somebody that's devoted, then you uphold a godly standard. Don't give in to their pressure. Oh, if you love me, you would. No. Because you know what? You don't want somebody who is not living by a godly standard. And if they're pressuring you, then they're not living by a godly standard. Amen? So if you, she's saying, if you want a relationship with me, we're going to follow some different rules. We're going to live by God's rules. Ladies, listen up. True love is never found by lowering your standards. Let me just say that again. True love is never found by lowering your standards. True lust is, but true love isn't. And lust is fleeting, it's temporary. But true love is lasting. To have a godly relationship, you need to live by godly standards. Godly relationships must be built on a foundation of godliness. If you're single and you want true love and like long marriage, identify up front those standards, those non-negotiables. Here's what we'll do, and here's what we will not do. Here are a couple of standards that should be at the top of your list. First, I will never sacrifice my relationship with the Lord for you. I will not stay with you if you draw me away from God. Or you pressure me to do something that is displeasing to God. If you expect me to put God second to you, I'm not staying with you. It'll come up. Oh, don't bother going to church this Sunday. Let's go hang out. Watch for those kinds of things. If you want the blessing of God, you need to be committed to only being with someone who will help you grow closer to God, and in turn, you help them grow closer to God. Several years ago, there was uh, a lady that um, she got uh, into a relationship with a guy, and, and he started coming to church because she told him, I won't marry you unless you're a Christian. So he starts coming to church. And in my interactions with this guy, it's very evident to me he's not a Christian. But he's coming to church because she told him, I won't marry you unless you're a Christian. So eventually they came to me for uh, premarital counseling, saying, you know, we're, we want to get married. So I start questioning him as I do. I'm giving away some of my secrets. I, I ask various questions to see where a person is spiritually. And again, very evident that he's not a Christian. And so I'm trying to tell her, I'm sorry, but I cannot perform this wedding. Because the Bible says, be not unequally young. Oh, but he's coming to church. I said, why is he coming to church? 
I said, is it because you told him, I won't marry you unless you're a Christian? Oh, no, but he's a Christian. Da, 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 da. Well, they persisted. They went ahead and got married. Not through me, but they went ahead and got married. I'm telling you, it wasn't even a month after they were married. That guy was never to be seen in church again. He came for a few weeks, but then he just disappeared. And I had told her, I said, you're going to end up, you know how they talk about people being football widows, where a guy's really into, into um, football, and so you don't see him during football season because he's watching the game? You know, I said, you're going to end up being a church widow. I said, in the fact that you're going to continue coming to church by yourself. You know, and I had told her that privately. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. So ladies, men, make your list, but don't tell the person that that's your list to say, I'm not going to marry you if you're not a Christian. Well, you know what? When they are in that stage of wanting to get you, they'll do it. But then after they've got you, it's another story, you know. Secondly, so like we said, the first thing is that uh, you'll not lower your standards. You'll not sacrifice your relationship with God for them. Secondly, I will not compromise God's standards of purity. All right. If they're allowing selfish, fleshly desires to dominate them before marriage, they will likely have a problem controlling their desires with other women after marriage. If they've got a lust problem before marriage, they're likely going to have a lust problem after marriage. So you're out to eat and a nice lady walks by and instead of him making eye contact with you and talking to you, you're talking to him and he's like, you know, so you, you want to be careful. You want to watch for these kinds of things. If you want a godly commitment with me, you've got to say, there's got to be a ring on this finger. We've got to walk the altar and we've got to make a vow to God. Folks, if you want a different result, you got to do things differently. If you want God's blessing on your relationship, you need to live a life that God can bless. And so if you're looking for somebody, these are the things you need to be looking for. If you're in a relationship, these are the things that you need to be praying for yourself and for your relationship. If we want to avoid the heartache of broken relationships and experience the joy, the passion, and the fulfillment that God created us to experience within the lifelong commitment of marriage between one man and one woman, then we need to commit to live differently. And if you're married, it starts with committing to be a person of godly character, to be a trustworthy person, and to live a life that is God-honoring. And if you're single, it starts with doing all of these things because to find the right person, you've got to be the right person. To find a godly person, you've got to be a godly person. But it also means making a commitment to only choose to pursue a relationship with someone who is committed to live this way then we can be confident of God's blessing. And, and I want to give you, before we close, I want to give you an assignment. I'm giving you homework. You know why? Because it's important to not just say amen to the message and go home and forget about it. We need to take the message home with us and put it into practice. So for married couples, before the day is over, take a moment and share with your husband or wife three things that you admire about him or her that will do so much to encourage them to build trust and to help them overcome any insecurities that they may have. It's going to help strengthen your relationship. So do that today. And, and then make it a pattern. Don't just make it a one-time thing. Make it a pattern, but start it today. And then singles, make your list of godly standards that you will not compromise for any relationship. Pray those standards into your life and then pray for whoever God brings into your life that they will also have those standards and do not compromise them. So make a list, write it out, check it twice, check it 2,000 times, pray it over your life. Amen. Be like Santa Claus. I'm making a list, checking it twice. All right. Make your list, write it out and begin to pray. Something about writing it out. Amen. That just solidifies it.
So that's your homework assignment. But before any of this, we need to start by committing to love God first in our life. And that starts with placing our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and repenting of our sins. Because it all starts with a relationship with God. If we want healthy earthly relationships, it starts with a relationship with God. And for all of us, we have all sinned and sin has broken our relationship with God. That's the very reason that Jesus left heaven and came to earth and gave his life as a sacrifice. He paid the penalty for our sins so that when we place our faith in him and repent of our sins, we can be forgiven and we can be restored to right relationship with him. So if you're here today or you're listening online and you have never repented of your sins, and repent simply means to turn away from, we recognize we've been heading in the wrong direction, living life without regard for God, living life our way, and we make a U-turn and we say, God, forgive me for living life apart from you. And we turn to him and we invite him to come and live inside of us. And the moment we do that, Jesus says we are born again. We are made spiritually alive. We're brought into relationship with God and we become his sons and his daughters. So if you're here today and you've never repented of your sins or placed your faith in Christ and you would like to, or maybe you did it several years ago and you've drifted away, but you can feel the Holy Spirit tugging at your heart, I want to encourage you to pray this prayer with me. Would you pray this prayer, dear Jesus? I believe that you are the Son of God. And I believe that you love me so much that you died for my sins. Today, I confess that I'm a sinner. I repent and I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. And I invite you to come live inside of me and help me from this day forward to live for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time or the first time in a long time, I want to say congratulations. You just made the best decision of your life and welcome to the family of God. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, I want to encourage you right now to text I prayed to the number on the screen or online type I prayed in the comments. Why? Not only because we want to rejoice with you and welcome you to the family of God, but also because that prayer is a beginning the beginning of a lifelong relationship with God. And we want to help you to grow in that relationship with God. So we want to send you free of charge a little e-booklet that will help you understand the prayer you just prayed and how to continue to grow in your newfound relationship with God. So if you do that right now, in-house, if you prayed that prayer, just type I, text I pray to the number on the screen or online type I prayed in the comments. A little later today, we will send you a response message with a link. Click on that link. Fill in your name and email address so that we can send you this free e-booklet. Once again, congratulations. And we want to encourage you that just prayed and every other Christian to do three things that will help you to grow in your relationship with God. One, talk to God every day. He is your loving Heavenly Father, and He wants to converse with you. He wants to hear from you every single day. So talk to God every day. That's what we call prayer. Start with thanksgiving. Thank him for the good things in your life because every good thing comes from him. And then talk to him about whatever problems or decisions or difficulties you're facing and ask his guidance and his help. Talk to him. He's your father. Pray every day. Secondly, let God talk to you. And the number one way that God talks to us is through the Bible. That's his word, his message to us. If you don't have a Bible, you can download the YouVersion app for free on your phone or your tablet. There's never a charge to read the Bible there. And we just encourage you to start reading in 1 John. 1 John is a short book in the New Testament near the end of the New Testament. But it tells us who Jesus is and what he's done for us. So it'll help you to understand your newfound faith in Christ and what he has done for you. Just read a few verses every day before you read. Say, God, help me to understand what I'm reading and to put it into practice in my life. Do that every day, and whatever stands out in that verse, uh, that whatever truth just jumps out at you and you understand it, pray that it'll become a reality in your life. Let God talk to you every day. Thirdly, find a local Assembly of God church. If you're here in South Florida, of course, we encourage you to be a part of the New Life family. We have a wonderful church family that will pray with you, walk alongside of you, and help you grow in your relationship with the Lord. If you're outside of the South Florida area, then we encourage you to find an Assembly of God church near to you and put down roots. Don't just attend a service. 
Church is so much more than just listening to sermons and singing songs, but it's about the relationships we build with one another that help to strengthen and encourage us along life's journey. So put down roots in that church. Get connected in relationship. If you do these three things regularly, you will continue to grow in your relationship with the Lord. God bless you. For those of us who've already accepted Jesus as our Savior, if you're married, God is calling you to commit yourself to being a person of godly character, trustworthiness, and living a life that is honoring to him. And if you're single, God is calling you to do all these things because to find a godly person, you need to be a godly person. So that means making a commitment to not compromise your relationship with God for anyone. It means walking in sexual purity. And it means only choosing to pursue a relationship with someone who is committed to live this way well. If you want God's blessing, you've got to do it God's way. And he invented love, he invented marriage, and he invented sex. So if you want to enjoy to the fullest this blessing, then we need to do it God's way. And if you would commit as a married person to be a person of godly character, trustworthiness, and to live a God-honoring life, if you're a single person, if you'll commit to do that and to only pursue a relationship with someone who's doing that, would you stand to your feet right where you are? Married or single, and you're committing to live this way. You that are at home. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining us today. If you are blessed by this message, would you consider giving a gift to help support our ministry? You can text any amount to 954-516-1522. Thank you so much, and we hope you will join us again. God bless you.